Okay, welcome again, and thank you for logging into my lecture today. Um, as mentioned before, I'm going to lecture about chapter 12 about marketing and consumer behavior. I have, um, of course, condensed the slides to just about 20 slides. Um, there are many more, more on Canvas, and the textbook has a lot more topics that I'm not going to address today. I just want to point to some of the key uh, elements of marketing and then i'm going to discuss our marketing assignment in addition to that i'm actually also going to just discuss our human entrepreneur assignment that is due next week so or for some of you it's due next week some other sections actually not but anyway let me start the slides with you Okay, so uh, marketing has um, uh, many, many different functions, right? Um, and um, although they're not always solely in charge of these functions, uh, they definitely have a big input. So one of the main functions of marketing is they communicate society's needs and wants to the organization. Why does the organization need to know society's needs and wants? Because so they can work on providing solutions for society and to solve the society's problems and serve their needs and wants. Um, marketing uh, departments also are involved in establishing pricing strategies, and we'll talk about that. Um, uh, promoting product and products benefits and promoting even the company, right? Uh, that's a lot of that is done through advertisement, promotion, um, uh, uh, public relations and so forth. Um, they're also involved in making product distribution decisions. How are they going to get the products or services to the customer, right? And they establish meaningful relationships with the customers. So let's just look at a little bit of the history of marketing because marketing wasn't always done the same way. In the old days, um, it was called, uh, there was a production era of marketing. So in other words, um, uh, marketing departments and marketers really focused heavily on the product itself. Um, this was very um, evident with the um, Model T of Ford, right? And, and they could do that because there was not a lot of competition. It was kind of the first product that was available for consumers, uh, that, that type of product, right? So uh, um, they were really focusing on, on production and producing um, um, uh, as many um, of these Ford models, and, or not necessarily as many, but, but um, you know, focusing on, on perfecting the model, right? Model T Ford. Um, then came the sales era, and the sales era was really focusing heavily on sales, where companies hired personal sales people. And not only when they are big sales, but even small sales like, like um, uh, um, a vacuum cleaner, a consumer market, in the consumer market, right? Where um, I'm sure, you know, you probably don't have experienced that anymore today, but, you know, if you watch old movies, there's sometimes a scene where there's a vacuum cleaner salesperson ringing the doorbell and they pull out their vacuum cleaner, they come in the house, they clean your living room floor or, you know, uh, um, so um, uh, that was, um, you know, and, and, and other products, right? They were, they were sold through personal selling. A vacuum cleaner brand that was notorious for doing that in, in, uh, back in the day was, uh, and they did it, actually, they did it for a long time. I don't know if they still do it, but some of the uh, sales approach is still used today, right? But the company was called Kirby, Kirby vacuum cleaners, right? So they were known for that, right? Anyway, so in the 50s, we the marketing era came. That's when companies focused on, on marketing heavily, but really only on one part of marketing and uh, or not only on, but mainly on getting the word out there, all the, the marketing communication, all the advertisements and, and really focusing not just that, but other areas of marketing as well. While the production era focused on the product, the sales era focused on uh, sales, increasing sales number. Marketing now started to incorporate the different functions of marketing and actually really creating a good product, getting it to the customer and communicating with the customer, right? Um, so uh, that, that's when the marketing era started. Um, and then in the 70s, we had a new um, concept called societal marketing that is still very, very present today. All of these actually are. And it, examples for that are the body shop or Starbucks, right? So they kind of um, 
uh, sol solve a problem, but also contribute positively to society. Like as uh, with the body shop ad advertises products that are environmentally more friendly, maybe, or that use no animal products or have some kind of positive uh, impact on society um, um, besides just being a profitable business, right? Um, uh, so, um, and then we have the customer relationship era, which is more recent, right? Examples of that are Amazon and the Ritz-Carlton hotels, right? Which are actually owned by Marriott Corporation. But um, so this era actually focuses on a, building a relationship with the customers, right? So the more they know about us customers, the better they can serve us. So they try, and, and this has been made possible also part of, partially because of technology just in the 90s, right? Um, so the more they know about us, the more information they find about, out about us, the better they can develop the products that we like, the better they can find a way to deliver the products to us at the time and place we need it at the price we need it, right? So, um, um, of course, all of these efforts did that as well, but customer relationship era really, really focuses on that. Okay, and I do that sometimes. I talk ahead of myself, I apologize. But here are again some points about the different eras, production era, the industrial revolution when, when things became automated, right? And, and we were able to produce more with less effort, right? Um, uh, the supplies, uh, there were limited supplies and strong demands. The 4T model sold no matter what, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, more people wanted it than they could make, right? It was really just a good quality product that sold itself. That was the production era. Uh, did I? The sales era, again, mid-20s to early 50s, when production uh, uh, was greater than demand. So you really had to um, make a large, bigger effort on selling products by hiring uh, personal sales uh, people and so forth, right? Um, there was more competition for customers because there were now more companies doing the same thing. You weren't the only one anymore. All, they relied also a lot on, on public advertising. And then the marketing concept was uh, focusing on, on different areas of, of the, uh, the um, um, marketing environment, uh, develop products that meet customer needs, commit total, the total organization to delivering superior products to the customer, right? And excellent customer service. So that means everybody in the company had to be in the game of making the customer happy by get, uh, creating good products and by uh, providing great customer service, uh, by having uh, great salespeople explaining the products to customers, by answering the phone when customers call and, and they have questions about how to use the product, things like that, right? Uh, for, uh, and they, tended to focus on products with highest profits because it costs more when you do all of this, right? So the, the higher the profits of a product, the more of um, the more the better service they provided. And then the societal marketing area, as I mentioned, that was co uh, companies that work not just for the benefit of themselves, but for the benefit of the consumer and society while making a profit. So they're helping society in some kind of way. Think about work, working with communities, not necessarily the local community, sometimes global communities, and making making life better for for other com, uh, uh, for other communities. An example of that would be, I don't know if you remember, they're still around. Tom's shoes. They had some kind of these shoes made out of canvas and natural materials. And every time you bought a pair of shoes, they would donate a pair of shoes to an, a. a uh, economically disadvantaged or to a developing community somewhere in the world, right? So that's an example of societal marketing. And again, customer relationship era is where everybody focused on, uh, on the customer and everybody in the company uh, made it their mission to work towards having a happy customer really, right? Okay. Uh, there's also marketing through nonprofits and other organizations. Here's a good example, right? Um, so just, I, I'm just throwing this in and it's also in the textbook just to remind everybody, it's not uh, marketing is not only done by companies that are, are around for profit. Nonprofit companies do marketing as well. You know, sometimes it's to get a message out and to discourage people from behaving in a certain way or encourage people from working another way. Um, 
uh, for, uh, or doing things another way, right? Or, or sometimes it's a, uh, it could be a, um, um, a marketing activity to get people to donate for a nonprofit organization, right? But they all still have to do marketing. Um, so let's talk about marketing strategy. You, uh, in the marketing strategy, you have a, a marketing mix and the marketing mix is described as the four P's. And those are the fundamentals of marketing that we need to remember. The four P's of marketing are your product, the, here in this picture, the shoes, the price, how much you're going to charge for it, your promotion, how are you going to get the word out to your market that this place exists, and market forces, which is um, basically the place where the product is available to, to your target market. Target market is I'm going to talk a little bit later, and that's actually what our assignment is about. But the target market is basically those that are most likely going to buy your products. So, um, so when you create a product, some of the things to keep in mind, and again, these are just very few bullets. There's a lot more detail to it, but we're only, we only have one week we're spending on marketing. Um, um, so um, we just touch on very high level topics, right? So the product, when you create a product, a good um, uh, strategy is um, a company that creates products should differentiate their products from other companies' products that are similar or that are in the same category. Because with a differentiation, you can stand out and you can now convince your market to buy your product versus the competition's product because you are different. And there are different ways to differentiate. There could be price differentiation. There could be, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, um, differentiations depending on the product. The differentiation factor has to be meaningful for the consumer though, or for the buyer, right? And then you also have to develop an effective brand. Not and effective, ineffective brand, right? There's a typo there. Uh, when you create a price, you have to make sure your cost is covered and that you are pricing your products competitively. However, of course, there still have to be profits made. Uh, so it all has to, has to fit in. Um, uh, so, and there are different pricing strategies, but, um, you know, some of the things you can think about is if you are in a market that is very saturated with a lot of sellers of similar products, you might want to price competitively because uh, a lot of others are already selling those type of products. That might be your strategy to enter the market or to gain market share from your competition, right? Um, but you still kind of have to cover your cost, right? Um, so, um, and if you don't, then you're, you're, if you don't cover your cost with any of your products, then your business is going to be in trouble. Right? Uh, promotion is, uh, are done to inform and persuade customers to buy your products and also to build positive customer relationships, right? Um, and, and some promotions are also done actually to, to uh, create brand awareness, uh, um, uh, um, or to announce new products or services or sales deals, percentage off and things like that. Those are all examples of promotions, right? And then the place, the last P is choose the right distribution channel or the right channel to get your product from your company or from your manufacturer to into the hands of the customer. You can do that by either... Um, um, selling directly to the customer where the customer comes to you or, or you even go to the customer or you meet somewhere at a retail location, at your own retail location, that's direct selling. But you can also use other distributors and wholesalers where your product might be offered in a, in a chain of retailers like Nordstrom's, right? Uh, Nordstrom's is nationwide. If you have a deal with Nordstrom's, um, uh, you are likely to sell more products because they have a bigger reach than a, if you are a smaller company, right? Uh, you ha they have a bigger reach, right? Yes, they're going to get a cut from, from the price that the customer pays, but you can also sell more. Um, and a company doesn't have to decide to do one or another distribution channel. They can use multiple. A good example is Apple. Apple has their own distribution channel and their own 
um, um, retail stores. If you go to an Apple store, that's an Apple retail store. That's a, a distribution channel from the manufacturer to the retailer, but they own the, re it's the, themselves, right? They sell it through their own stores. But you can also buy Apple products as other retailers like Costco and I think probably Best Buy and some other um, retailers will sell Apple products as well, right? So, um, and that's all something that the market, uh, you know, deciding on, on where your customers are, where your customers shop, um, uh, um, where there's a bigger market and so forth. There are a lot of, dis uh, a lot of um, factors that go into making the decision of which channels to use. And, 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 and how to distribute your product, make sure they get into your customers' hands at the time that they need them, that you de deliver a good product at the right price and at the right time to the customer. So the marketing process, first you identify a market need, right? And that's why I was saying in the beginning, you know, you know mark, the marketing department communicates society's needs to the company, right? Um, and then they, uh, uh, once you identify the need and that you have products that could solve that problem with, right? You conduct a market research and develop a marketing plan around that, right? Um, you identify a target market. That's what we're going to do as homework. And I'll talk a little more about that. Then you implement the four Ps and then you um, work on uh, building and keeping a good customer relationship, right? The reason why you want to keep a, a good relationship with your customer after the sale is because you want that customer to come back and buy from you again. If all you care about is getting that customer's money from that one sale um, and you don't build a relationship, next time a customer has a need for your products or services, they're probably not going to come to you, but going to go to the competition who ha may have been able to better communicate with them. And um, maybe they weren't satisfied with the way you supported them after the sale. After sales support is very important. Um, another topic that's in the te uh, text is a marketing plan. A marketing plan is a written document with clear marketing objectives, just like any plans, you have to have some objectives and goals. What are you trying to achieve? What do you, why are you doing this, right? So um, uh, marketing objectives have to go, of course, with the rest of the company's objectives. They can't conflict, right? Um, and sometimes it could be they want to increase market share, or it could be enter into a new market, or maybe it's a new product and you want to gain as many customers as possible, right? Uh, so there are always objectives that you have to um, decide what they are because without objectives, you don't know how what you're trying to reach, right? Um, then you do a performance of a situational, situational SWOT analysis of that situation. I believe we did a SWOT analysis in the class already where you uh, 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 do a strength, we, where you evaluate the strength and weaknesses of the company and look at the current opportunities and threats, right? And of course, those can change over time. You know, a company could be very good at something this year and, and there could be great opportunities and maybe the following year something happened to the economy and maybe new competitors came. Now the company has more weaknesses and there are, there are less opportunities. So that's why it's a situational SWOT analysis, right? So you got to know where you stand. You find your objectives. What are you trying to do, right? Where are you trying to be? Where are you right now? What are your strengths and weaknesses? And really, I always say focus more on your strength because you want to use your strength to achieve your objectives, right? But don't neglect your weaknesses. Um, some of them you might have to improve. And then look at what's out there, what opportunities are out there and what would be a threat and how can you use or your strength and strength to, to go after opportunities and, and to deal with threats, right? Then you select a target market. You look at who's most likely to buy your products. And then you implement, evaluate, and, uh, uh, and control the marketing mix. After you have created the plan, you, you know, have an implementation strat uh, plan. And, and after you do what you say you're going to do, you have to evaluate it, measure it. If you didn't have objectives to start with, you, you, can, you, you don't know if you achieved what you wanted to achieve because you didn't really have any objectives, right? So did you reach your goals or did you... Uh, did you 
surpass your goals? Did you, or, you know, did you not reach them? And then you might have to adjust things or change some strategies, right? Based on the outcome. It's a continuous process. It's not something a company writes once when they, uh, writes once when they, st when they start the company, but it's a living document. It keeps changing their annual plans, right? Okay, now let's get to the target market. So target market means um, when we're talking about consumer markets, a target market is, a, um, um, is when uh, you divide the whole market into segments, into different categories, and you determine which segments are most likely to um, be attracted to your products and to buy, and which ones are the ones that can afford your product and which ones are in the areas and things like that. So to do that, and, and again, con we're, we're talking about consumer markets now, you have to really go uh, evaluate the market into different segments. So, so here are the four variables that we can look at. So one of them is a geographic variable. So this is, um, and, and not all of these are always relevant to all products, right? but most of them are, um, uh, but um, geographic would be, you know, the physical location, what type of region is it? Is it suburban, rural? Is it a city, more urban environment? You know, um, think about clothing that we do to go out or to go to work when we're not at, when we're not at home, right? Um, if you're in a more rural area, you're probably more likely to have wear a different type of clothing than if you live in an urban area or the, even the type of cars you drive. You know, if you live in a, a rural area, um, you probably have to drive more distances and there is more space everywhere. If you live in New York City, you probably want to have the smallest car possible because of parking problems, right? So, so that's, this is why, you know, sometimes it might, you might think it doesn't matter, but you really have to think a little more about it to determine if it matters or not and, and do some research, right? Um, the population density really has to do with rural or not. The climate, of course, for clothing or, or other things, you know, uh, climate is sometimes very relevant. The terrain, is it flat? Is it sea level by the ocean? Is it mountainous? You know, that kind of stuff can have an impact on um, um, uh, whether or not the population there is likely or not likely to use the product. Um, but let me um, give an example of something where even where it could be that even though your target market lives by the beach, breezes, works by the beach basically, um, you might still be able to sell them products like snowboards. You know, think about the Bay Area. How many people here go snowboarding to places they can get, get to in, uh, as little as three hours, right? So that's still, that can be still a target market. So you're not just looking at one variable. You're not just looking at geographic. You have to look at all of them. The next one and probably most significant one is the Demogra uh, demographic variable. This um, um, identifies the, the typical customer in terms of these categories. These are, you know, some of these, and you don't have to use all of them, but they're, you know, you, you can, you, you can, some of them might not matter, you know, eight in most cases is relevant. And, and a lot of times um, family size could be relevant. Race, religion, and ethnicity is not always relevant, but can be sometimes, right? Gender, when it comes to clothing, it's pretty relevant, right? Um, income is very relevant because they have to be able to afford your product. And education can be relevant as well, but not always, right? Some, some products are more used by different types of education. And education oftentimes is also re related to income. The more education you have, the higher income you have, but not always. You, you could sell luxury products uh, which, you know, uh, you want a high income, but then there are people that are business owners and don't have a formal education, but they could be great target for your products, right? So, you, uh, again, you really have to do some research and, and, and find out what uh, 
type of demographic segmentation is most relevant for a certain product. The next one is psychographic. Those are a person's lifestyle, personality, traits, motives. Why are they doing things? What are their values? And, uh, you know, again, using the, the example of the snowboarder, you know, maybe the snowboarder lives in the area where it will never snow like the Bay Area, but maybe she lo loves the thrill of snowboarding and going down that mountain and doing the jumps and all that stuff. Uh, that snowboarders do, right? So that's a lifestyle that, that people like that lifestyle. Some, some people like to travel and stay in luxury hotels. Other people like to travel and go camping, right? But then there are the people that also like both. So you really, again, have to identify. And sometimes it's not, some of these, uh, again, are not always relevant, right? Personality traits, are they more spontaneous, more risk takers? Right? Or are they more, you know, those, those kind of things sometimes play a value. What, why are they doing things? Do they buy things to, you know, what are their motives? Do they want to buy something to look good, to impress people? Are they buying it for convenience? Uh, are they, more, you know, so those kind of things. And then what are the values? Some people have, I, I mean, people have different values. Um, and um, again, they don't, not all the categories are always is distinguishing factor, but most of them are. And then behavioral segmentation has to do with um, the benefits people are seeking when they buy a product, the volume usage, how often do they buy? Is it something you uh, somebody buys just once or is it something they buy weekly or daily or is it subscription, you know, subscription-based models they, they buy usually on a monthly, they renew their subscription. How brand loyal are they? How likely are they going to switch to other brands? And that probably is also, by the way, related to pricing. If you're not the most competitively priced company in your product category, you probably want to look for brand loyal people that aren't going to switch to another brand because they like your brand and they want to stay with your brand, right? But if you are one of those that is a low cost alternative to brand names, right? Let's let's talk about uh, athletic shoes, Nike, right? Maybe you're not a Nike, but you're a low cost brand. And um, you are um, um, not, probably not looking for brand loyal people, right? But you are looking for people that are price sensitive, right? And then product end use, what are they using the product for? Some products have, multiple functions right so what are they going to use it for are they using it themselves or are they buying it for their children for example you know young children they usually don't shop by themselves it's the parents that buy them stuff so their end use is not for their personal but for their children's use so those kind of things are important all right um the next topic is consumer behavior it's the way individuals or organizations sort uh, search for, evaluate, use, and dispose of goods and services. So it's the things that goes on, or that go on, that go on in our mind when we recognize a need and make a final purchasing decision, and why we might decide one brand over another. Or, you know, so um, um, so that's a you know our buying behavior. What influences us when we buy? Um, uh, it helps marketers select the most profitable target markets and implement the right marketing mix for that specific market that they have selected. Um, so here's the process. You know, in the beginning, you realize you need something when you, that's the first step of when you, that, that happens in your mind when you think you need to buy something. So I'm going to give an example. Um, the season is changing. We are in fall now. It's getting colder. Um, I need some boots. Now, let's define the word need real quick. I don't really need boots. I have boots already, right? But last year was COVID. I didn't buy any clothes last year. We're all at home. We didn't have, you know, don't go out much. Fashion changed a little bit, not much. This year a lot changed. And, and I really think I need boots because they need to be the more fashionable boots now, uh, even though I still have some. So a need doesn't have to be something that you really, really need. But in my mind, I need it because I want to have more new boots for um, whatever reason, whatever my motives are, right? 
It could be because I want to look good. It could be because I want to look trendy. It could be because I'm, or maybe somebody needs boots because they're moving to a colder climate and they don't have cold weather boots. That's possible as well, right? But somehow I need boots, right? Then I search, I, I do my information search. I look at, right now, I would typically look at websites, look at some, uh, you know, online online shopping and, and look at the trends or whatever. Um, if I have time, I might go to a mall and try some on, right? Uh, that's my information search, search. And then I come up with some alternatives. Maybe I find three different ones that I like and I now I have to decide which one to get and I make a purchase, purchase, uh, purchasing decision. I decide to uh, buy one of the three alternatives that I have evaluated, right? Um, because of whatever reason. And then I buy them and I use them. And after I buy them, I have something called post-purchase decision where marketers really wanna make sure that after you make a purchase that you don't have rem buyer's remorse, right? If you have buyer's remorse, it's not a positive experience, but it's very often that we can have buyer's remorse. And that is because nobody likes to part from their money. But when we buy something, we have to part from our money. So we might think briefly, oh, how can companies prevent or minimize buyer's remorse by really setting the expectations right, offering great products that the customer expected? not disappointing them and sometimes through building customer relationships even after the sale. Um, what influences consumer decision making? There are, extra, there are internal things that you do that we just talked about, the, the, the decision making process that goes out in our minds, but we're also influenced by external factors. And they're listed here, five of them. So one of them is sociocultural influences. Um, those are like cultures or subcultures, your social class, family. A lot of us are influenced by our friends, our peers. People we hang out with tend to be similar from us. And a lot of times we want validation from, from our peers and our groups, right? Or uh, uh, peers could be people at work too, right? Or it could be in a sports team, right? Um, the next one is psychological influences. That's those are, you know, more motivations. They could be, you know, those are actually more internal. What motivates you? What are your perceptions and attitudes, right? Then you have situational influences, physical and social surroundings, and that are that might get you to purchase a certain type of products that you might not even have thought of purchasing, right? Uh, uh, but because of the way things are and because of a, is it again, situational thing, you're like, okay, I, I, I think I really need this now, right? Uh, and of course, marketing mix. This is where the company's marketing department comes in. The products available, the price that they're available at, the promotions that the companies make about those products and how accessible are those to you as a consumer. And the last one is personal influences, age, economic situation, lifestyle, and personality. Uh, you know, you, you have different um, uh, needs and wants at different age, stages in your life. So, you know, when you're young, it's different. When you're a student, it's different. When you're in your, the beginning of your career, it's different. Then you might get married, the thing, and then you move together. All of a sudden, you have a need for furniture. And then eventually you might have children and then you buy children's products and, and you retire and then you have different, you know, may, maybe then you have more time to travel. So you have a need for travel products and so forth. Right. Um, so, and then of course, economic situation, number one, if we can't afford it, we're never going to be in a target market of a company. Right. But anyways, those are some other things that influence our decision-making uh, process. Uh, last slide, uh, we talked about the consumer market, which is the B2C business to consumer market. The B2B market is when businesses sell to businesses. And there is a little bit of diff no, actually not a little bit, a lot of difference. Um, uh, uh, B2B markets would be, for example, um, if I'm a, a semiconductor manufacturer, I have customers that don't buy one chip, but they buy tens of thousands that they're going to use in their products. That's the business to business market, right? Uh, so there are fewer customers versus in a business to consumer market, every individual can be a consumer. There are many customers, right? 
in, when you sell to a business, you have large volume sales, right? You sell in huge quantities versus business to consumer. It's usually one, one, right? Or, you know, smaller quantities at least. And then, you know, B2B, they, they usually are geographically concentrated. You usually have sales professionals that work with certain geographic areas, right? Um, uh, in the B2C market, you may have salespeople too, but they're like, usually retail sales, not as sophisticated um, because the consumers do more of an emotional purchase. In the business to business market, it's a more rational per, per, uh, per, uh, purchase decision because especially cost is important, quantity, can they deliver the quantity when the company needs it and all that stuff. So you really have to think that. And then the process is a little bit different, right? You have more trained buyers we consumers are not really trained buyers, not like in, in, in buyers within the organization. And a few other um, um, uh, uh, points that um, the slides makes, you can review this in the textbook as well. Anyway, um, that is it for the slides. Um, I am now going to share with you our assignment on the target market. Actually, you know what? Let me stop here real quick. Um, I'm gonna pause the recording for a minute. Okay, so here's our assignment where you have to identify the target market for specific products. And here are the products. So, um, and these are all consumer products, business to consumer, not business to business. So when we talk about a high-end automatic espresso maker, don't say you're going to sell it to coffee shops. It's for the home, right? It's consumers. Uh, an affordable electric car, not a Tesla. Uh, fast food restaurant selling burgers, a health coach focusing on exercise and nutrition, and something that you can choose your own product. And then on, in the textbook, um, you will see the... Um, same table I just showed on page 367. And make sure it's the one here at the bottom, not this. This is something completely different. It's this table, right? Table 12.2, the same thing we just went over, right? Um, and um, create a table for each of those products. So put on the top high end, um, espresso maker, and then tell me, um, you know, let's say in the demographic, tell me what age range, tell me uh, what income you're going to target, tell me what um, uh, um, uh, education, if education level matters, and then the psychographic, there, what, what type of personality traits could matter, right? So anything that matters, if it doesn't matter, leave it out. Um, uh, but don't tell me for any of those products. Age doesn't matter. Anybody can use my products. None of these products is that. The only product that age doesn't matter is air. Everybody needs to breathe, right? We're not selling air or, or water, right? But, but uh, you know, um, so don't sell, don't say any. You might want to do some research um, and um, see who is most likely to eat fast food hamburgers. Who are the most common electric car drivers that are not Tesla? You, you'll find a lot of information online. Make sure you use table format. You can create it in Excel if you want um, and then convert it into a PDF when you upload it. If you prefer work, this would be an easy one to work on Excel or just create it in Word or whatever. All right, um, any questions about this assignment? You guys are quiet, but that's okay. All right, I'm going to go to the next assignment, which is not related to marketing, uh, but it is our human entrepreneur project that is due soon for this class next week, Sunday. Um, so um, here are the instructions, and I'm sure a lot of you already looked at it, and, and some of you already emailed me with questions. Um, 
I'm just going to briefly go over it so you, you can um, you know, get a better idea. Uh, first of all, I want you to um, uh, format it this way. I don't want you to use bullets or anything, but I want you to break it down into this. So you can say, you know, uh, do a brief introduction and then you can write as a heading goals or my goals. And then, uh, and then under the subheading mission statement and then financial goals, family goals, professional goals, format it as nicely as possible. Make it nice and clean, right? Don't write just one long essay. It break it down into these bullets. Right. But don't use bullets. This is just for you to see what sections you should have. And then what is your plan? So the next major uh, uh, master heading should, could be my plan. And then you could talk about the subheading could be industries uh, uh, and then educational requirements and then my steps, whatever. Right. And then how are you different? Your differentiation. So this is a little bit of marketing related because you know, even though we're not working in a company as marketers, we are always selling ourselves. We always have to market ourselves, whether we're looking for a job, whether we're uh, looking, even if, when we're applying for colleges, we're making ourselves look good. We're communicating with the colleges. They should hire us as students, right? Same with jobs, right? Uh, do your own personal SWOT analysis, right? What are your strengths and weaknesses? and then look at the external stuff, opportunities and threats. This should be a table, just like the SWOT analysis in the um, uh, assignment we had. Make it a table. It's very easy to read when it's a table. Um, and then how will you market yourself? Create a fictitious, not a real one, a business card. Let's say you want to be a real estate investor one day. You can create yourself a real estate business card. There are tools online for free. Uh, you can even go to Word and get a template to create a business card. This is for you to be a little creative and get some good points for your um, paper, right? Uh, and then finally, um, create a resume. Probably a lot of you already have one. It doesn't matter how much experience you have in your resume. I'm not going to grade you based on that. I'm going to grade you based on is your resume professionally looking. And there are a lot of sources, even templates online that you can use to create your resume. Make it look professional, right? It doesn't matter how many jobs you had, even if you had no jobs and are just still in high school or right out of high school and only volunteered and didn't do anything else. You can always talk about your education, the clubs you attended, the sports you did, whatever, right? So um, if you don't have a resume, you'll create one, but usually most of my students have some type of resume, right? So if you have one, you know, maybe use this as an opportunity to improve it, right? And then contingency plan, what if? What if this doesn't work, what can you do? Um, this should be written in a professional manner. Um, it depends on your experience and all that stuff, but two to three pages single space. And I do single space because typically, business uh, documents are not double spaced. This is not a research paper. This is your career plan. So make it single spaced, okay? Um, so um, two to three pages, two pages is really short. This doesn't include your resume or anything, right? So um, two to three pages, uh, not including your logo and resume. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to stop the recording.